In part one, I took a look at Bev's claim that one degree every 69 miles is a geometric statement in a linear relationship. But this is all that Bev drew on his whiteboard, two angles that are 69 miles apart on a horizontal which he labeled advanced simplicity. But since Bev likes to boast that you can do fuck all with an angle, he didn't understand that he could have used trigonometry and found out that nope, those 10 degree segments on a horizontal are not a linear relationship, but increase in size as you move farther away from the GP. So in part two, I'll take a look to see if the on the level panelist paper organist had a logical explanation for Polaris. Also a few more things that we can do with the fucking angle. And is there a better geometric model for one degree equals 60 nautical miles? Also, I'll throw in a few examples of geometric globe evidence to show Bev that yes, there are globe believers with geometric evidence of the globe model. So let's have a listen to paper organist. Mm -hmm. This is just perspective drop. The star is not dropping. It is because uh, our sight works that way, that uh, objects uh, which are going away from us uh, uh, in a um, straight line, horizontal line, let's say, uh, they are going down in perspective. So this is very well known fact, but this is it. This is just perspective. Perspective drop? Hmm, sounds like a flat earth meme to me. Yes, we all agree that a row of horizontal lights angle down to the horizon. So when we're talking about perspective, we're talking about the visual angle or how big the object appears to be, which is also the same as angular size. And since Paper Organist is part of Bev's realizing Euclid journey, they should understand that these angles are based on trigonometry. We know it's not the actual size of the object that changes with distance. It's the angular size, or how big the object appears to be. And this angular size can either be measured with surveying equipment or calculated if we know the object's actual size and distance. And we know that there is a pattern to perspective. Since the rate of angular change decreases with distance, a row of the same size objects will appear closer together as they get farther away. And it is quite easy to see this with this row of streetlights. So what Paper Organist calls perspective drop is causing three things to happen with these lights and poles. They appear lower, smaller, and closer together with distance. Now we see the exact same thing with the jet flying overhead since it also appears lower and smaller with distance. But since we don't see a row of jets appearing closer with distance, the jet appears to go slower with distance. Now in regards to the sun, or even the moon, has paper organists ever seen this happen? Because the measured sun and moon actually move at 15 degrees per hour. And I showed this in a recent upload when I made videos of sunrise and sunset from my current location in Bangkok, Thailand. So I used my P900 sunset time lapse setting which takes a series of photographs for 50 minutes and turns it into a 10 second video. Now since the sun moves at 15 degrees per hour, then I should see a constant 12.5 degrees per every 50 minutes. I'm going to start with two sunrise time lapses, and I'm using 11 day in welder's class to cut down on the glare. And remember, anybody can repeat this experiment. So the first time lapse started with the sun just right above that building. And here is the second time lapse. And you can see that the sun moved the same angular distance for each of those 50 minute segments. And here are some time lapses for sunset. So here's the first 50 minute segment. And the second one. And I tried for a third one, but rain clouds moved in and it just got too dark and they blocked the sun. But again, just like we saw with sunrise, the sun moves at a constant angular distance across the sky every 50 minutes. So sorry, paper organist, but this is not a sun setting due to perspective drop. Not even close. Now another question I asked in that video is what path does this sun take at night to return to the east to rise again in the morning? And it makes logical sense that the sun is going to continue on that same path at the same angular speed after sunset. 
Does anyone really think that this sun would suddenly stop moving down at the horizon? So this means that the sun path at night is opposite of the observed daytime sun path. And of course, when you live in Bangkok and the daytime sun path is at such a steep angle to the horizon, this means that at night the sun travels below you. My step-grandson was even able to figure this out when he was six years old. And this definitely works on a globe because Earth's rotation makes it appear as though the sun is orbiting around you. So Bev, here's the geometry of the Bangkok sun on your horizontal plane Earth. And if you don't think the sun goes below the Earth's surface at night, then what is the correct geometry? Now what about Polaris, which is also called the North Star and has been a very important beacon for navigation? First of all, I can find my latitude by just measuring the angle of Polaris above the horizon. I can also figure out if I'm traveling towards the north or south depending on if Polaris is moving higher or closer to the horizon. And if the angle of the North Star above the horizon was known at the destination, then throughout history both mariners and travelers knew that they could use this information to help guide them to their destination. And here's something else we can do with fucking angles to Polaris. About four months ago, I uploaded this video, Our North Celestial Star Trails Globe Evidence. Here are two well-known constellations in the northern sky, Ursa Minor and Major. Now in America, they're commonly referred to as the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, which has Polaris at the end of its handle. And I'm going to take a look at these two stars, Dubhe, which is 28 degrees away from Polaris, and Alcade, which is 41 degrees away. Since the Big Dipper makes a counterclockwise rotation around Polaris every day, that means that the paths of these two stars are circles with Polaris at its center. Now in my hometown of Seattle, Polaris is about 47.6 degrees above the horizon. So on a clear night, I could always see the Big Dipper when it was below Polaris. Now I currently live in Bangkok, Thailand, and from here Polaris is about 13.8 degrees above the horizon. So it's pretty obvious that when the Big Dipper is below Polaris, the reason I can't see it is because it is below the horizon. I also spent almost a year in Cairns, which is on the northeast coast of Australia, and this is where I learned to scuba dive. Now on a clear night, you could see the Big Dipper as it passed over the top of Polaris, but again, it's pretty obvious why Polaris is not visible from Cairns. So again, Bev, if this globe geometry is wrong, then what is the correct geometry on your horizontal plane Earth? Let's have one final listen to Bev. Or oh, did everybody else have some other different idea about it? People, um, people I, I've I talked to that. did have, a, you know, a different understanding because I don't think anybody's ever showed them uh, the, the simple geometric uh, version of how this works. Warning, trigger alert, curved lines will be discussed. Well, Bev, this is really not that difficult. Here we have a 360 degree circular protractor. So let's take a look at the first 90 degrees and ask the question, are these congruent 10 degree curved line segments? Looks like that to me. And what if we have a smaller circumference? Hmm, again, it looks like the answer is yes. Now I'd be willing to bet that this globe geometry works. So we have a globe with a radius of 3,959 miles and that gives us a 24,875 mile circumference. And since this is the equivalent of 21,600 nautical miles, that means that one degree equals 60 nautical miles, 10 degrees equals 600 nautical miles, and 90 degrees equals 5,400 nautical miles. And it's really not that hard to understand that these are congruent 10 degree curved line segments that are 600 nautical miles long. So how does this relate to Polaris, which would be at zenith above the North Pole? Well, let's start by adding verticals to 80 degrees, 60 degrees, 40 degrees, and 20 degrees north latitude. Next, I'll add horizontals that are tangent to those points. Now since Polaris is light years away from Earth, that means that its light strikes Earth in parallel rays, and that is represented by these four lines that are parallel to the North Pole zenith line. 
And look at that, the angles that are measured from the horizontal match the latitude angles. And this is also true for 70 degrees, 50 degrees, 30 degrees, and 10 degrees north latitude. So here we have two models for Polaris, the horizontal plane earth model, which is a reification fallacy, and the globe earth model, which matches observed reality. So for Biv and his companions, this geometry really is not that difficult. You should try it sometime. Just try thinking of what the fuck you can do with an angle.